Good morning and welcome to the Dean's Forum at St. John's Cathedral in Denver, Colorado. I'm Richard Lawson, the Dean, and I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Coakley. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. I would like to offer a prayer and then I'll introduce our guest speaker and then we'll, we'll, we'll dive in with a range of questions, all of which relate to Easter, this, this wonderful season that we're in. And the prayer I'm going to offer Dr. Coakley and everyone is um, the prayer uh, from the Book of Common Prayer for this, the second Sunday in Easter. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Just a bit of housekeeping, Dr. Coakley, before we begin, I think it's probably important to say that you and I are recording this on um, Wednesday, the 20th of April. Um, it, it'll be launched on our website here at the Cathedral this coming Sunday, but it is good to note that it's pre-recorded. Um, welcome. It's really good to see you. You're coming to us, I believe, from uh, Alexandria or D.C.? Alexandria, Virginia. So Alexandria is your home now. It is for most of the year. We're usually in Oxford in the summer. Hmm. Dr. Coakley is uh, the Professor Emerita at the University of Cambridge. She is, uh, was formerly at the Harvard Divinity School here in the States, of course, and is incredibly well published. And I do, Dr. Coakley, just want to draw attention to a few of your books at the beginning in case anyone is um, interested um, you, you, you're widely published, and I would love for you to say a little bit about your, your work in just a moment. One of the books that we've actually referred to in, in the um, Dean's Forum about a year ago is, is a wonderful book. Let's see if I can hold this up and get it in the camera. This is a book that you did with a colleague, I believe, at Harvard Divinity School, and the title is Evolution, Games, and God, The Principle of Cooperation, a, a fascinating book. Um, looking at um, evolution and, and a theological take on evolution and where there are places within evolutionary theory uh, that, that, that implicitly or perhaps explicitly point toward um, God. And another book that we might get to refer to today is the first in your um, anticipated, I believe, three volume systematics. And this one is called God, Sexuality and the Self an essay on the Trinity. And then finally, I was going to highlight, Dr. Coakley, if someone's looking for, a, I think, an introduction to your work, a nice place to begin is, I believe, is the new asceticism. It's, it's a smaller volume. The subtitle is Sexuality, Gender, and the Quest for God. And it's a, 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 um, several essays of yours published down through the years that I think is, is a nice introduction. You, you, you've published um, and, and of course, you're you're a, a Gregory of Nyssa scholar and a patristic scholar. Would you? How do you characterize your work? What would you say about it? Well, in very short compass, I suppose what I feel most distinctively I've tried to bring to the theological discussion is an integration of prayer, especially prayer of a relatively vulnerable, world wordless sort whether you describe it as silent or quiet prayer or contemplative prayer, and its relationship to our theological thinking, because at the, the heart of the whole theological endeavor is an impossible task, the task of speaking of God, speaking of, a, of therefore, that which is not like any other entity, is not an entity in the universe, but that without which we would not be in being at all. And so... The great traditions of patristic and monastic scholarship um, have always united the undertakings of spiritual practice and of theology. And my belief is that when you redo that, when you plat these together at a deep level, new insights fall out of the tradition, which have particular importance for some of the most significant difficulties that we're confronting socially and politically today. Um, and they often involve finding resources in the tradition 
both ancient and modern, which are not the ones that are normally brought to the forefront when teaching doctrine, because they focus more on this locus of theology in the great yearning of prayer in prayer for God. So I would say that that's, that's, that's key to everything I do. But you've rightly said that um, I've been engaged in a very great amount of interdisciplinary work um, in my academic life and in the university, because I feel we're living in a generation where theology is to some extent fighting for its life in the secular university. And the more links and rich connections we can make with uh, scientists, social scientists, especially um, artists, um, humanities people, the more our, our um, enterprise is energized and the more lay people we draw into that great conversation. Mm, wonderful. Thank you. And the, this link between theology and prayer very much so relates to the conversation you and I have prepared for, for this, this um, Sunday. So we're in the, uh, the beginning of the Easter season, and I hope you had a wonderful Holy Week and, and Easter. And so we're thinking about um, Christ's resurrection and the mystery of resurrection. And I want to set this up by just telling you a little bit, um, and I'll do it quickly. When, when I remember when I was um, in college, and I don't know how I stumbled upon it. It was not in classes, but but I remember um, beginning to uh, read a little bit about the Jesus of history, you know, versus the Christ of faith. And, and there were so many then, and even to a degree now, I think a lesser degree now. But you know, so many popular books were, were being published, and were on the books, were on the shelves at our local bookstore on the on the campus about all of this. And and I remember. I became quite fascinated for a year or two uh, about this search for the historical Jesus until it became utterly exhausting, <laughs> <laughs> just utterly exhausting. Um, and, um, and so I was fascinated um, in graduate school to come across a, a, one of your essays in particular about the resurrection. And it's a book of yours called, um, Powers and Submissions, and it's a book, I forget the exact title, but it's um, the, the Resurrection in the Spiritual Senses. Um, and you've got in that essay a, a different take on the on the resurrection. You're, you're not opposed to the historical search, but you perhaps see it as, as just one and a limited move among a range of ways in which we, like Mary Magdalene, um, gracefully turn toward the risen Christ. Do you mind saying a bit about that? Sure, yes. Well, I think we're very stuck in the modern period between two apparently disjunctive choices on how to respond to the problem of the resurrection if we find it problematic. And if we don't find it problematic, there must be something peculiar about us because this is <laughs> the deepest mystery and the most profound, as it were, linchpin of our faith. Um, so we ought to be bothering about it. And in the modern period, on the one hand, there's been a great desire to um, justify belief in the resurrected Christ through historical investigation um, by looking at the evidences for the resurrection in the New Testament, both the empty tomb traditions, which are not at all consistent, as you know, um, and the so-called appearance traditions, supremely in um, mm. Paul's discussion of his own experience of meeting the, resin, the, the risen Christ. And to see whether um, we've got enough, as it were, justifying evidence to believe in a risen Jesus. So this is very much inspired by the empirical investigative methods of, say, uh, David Hume and John Locke um, uh, uh, and others since them. That's one alternative. Um, and there are still um, enormously significant theologians um, in this generation. N.T. Wright is one of them. Richard Swinburne in the philosophy of religion arena, who think that this is the proper and sole way to approach the issue and that we must be able to justify our belief on these historical evidential grounds. The other approach, which was a sort of flip side of that coin, came with theologians in the existential or so-called dialectical tradition um, in the early to mid 20th century, who felt that this was completely false approach to the resurrection and that this was a matter of 
a, a kind of Kierkegaardian leap into the unknown um, that was being required of disciples, an existential matter, a matter that could never be caught and held within the secular historical, should never be investigated in the way that a detective would investigate a murder, for instance. And that approach is very profoundly um, represented by leading theologians such as Rudolf Boltmann or, or Karl Barth, especially in his early work. So for a long time in my own life, I really struggled with this because I was, I think, brought up on David Hume with my mother's milk. And I thought it was very important that one not try and short circuit that quite appropriate historical investigation. But the more I did this investigation, the more I realized that the best I could get to on those lines, on those secular historiographical lines, was a kind of elusive question mark. It wasn't that I could rule it out, but I found that it couldn't clinch anything for me. Um, but by the same token, I felt that the op opposite existential approach just seemed like special pleading. Um, it seemed um, extraordinarily important that the empty tomb stories were not, as it, as it were, set on one side, as if some kind of experiential response was the only matter that, that was significant for Christian faith. And it was for many years that I was personally stuck on this. And then in the course of research for other things, I came across this very rich and interesting tradition that begins in the early centuries of uh, Christian patristic thought with a writer called Origen in the third century in Alexandria and later in, in Caesarea, who um, came up with a theory that our um, epistemic, our, our epistemic responses, the responses of the human to knowledge are um, aspects of the human that don't come as it were ready made for reception of the divine. Rather, the processes of sanctification in the human life work on our sensorium and on our intellectual and willing life over a period of transformation. And thus um, honing one's uh, sensorial uh, capacities is not an instantaneous event in the Christian life, but something that requires literally practice in the spirit. Um, and uh, the life of prayer, therefore, and the life of the ingestion of the sacraments um, and the life of the response of people in need and all aspects of our Christian life are important for our being able to approach a point where we can personally respond to the risen life of Christ. So we shouldn't be too surprised if this involves quite a lengthy quest. Mm. That's, the, that's the Inuche answer. And then if you go back to the actual stories about the resurrection in the New Testament, this I think helps to explain some of the more curious dimensions of them. For instance, why did it take Mary two turnings in the story about the garden for her to recognize Jesus? Why didn't right. she recognize him immediately? Why was it that even in the very last chapter of Matthew, it is, it is acknowledged that when Jesus made his last appearance in Matthew, some doubted. There were people there who still didn't get it, didn't see it. Um, and, or again, how could you walk the whole way to Emmaus? Exactly. And, and not know who you were talking to until he does something that opens your eyes. So there are these hints and guesses in the New Testament that suggest that there's some kind of response in the human that has to be opened out and up in the spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, for us to respond fully and to acknowledge Jesus's presence amongst us. Mm. So to take the example of Mary Magdalene or, or of the, the, the two walking with, with Jesus on the road to, to Emmaus, would you say then, um, you know, for some of us that turning perhaps happens quickly and for some of us it takes decades? Just from my pastoral experience, I would say yes. I don't know. Um, by the way, there are people who explain the road to Emmaus story as a confection of Luke's theology, whereby in a period after Jesus ceased to be seen directly, um, he came to be taught as present in the Eucharist. But I think that's unnaturally skeptical. I, I think there are many other 
hints, as we've just said in the New Testament, that it was a very elusive and extraordinary thing confronting the risen Christ um, and uh, not easy for everyone to respond to immediately. Of course, there's some pretty speeded up stuff going on in the New Testament, but in our lives now, it may be that um, there is a very considerable preparation before we can say with absolute certainty, my Lord and my God, and acknowledge Christ's presence amongst us, and not just amongst us, but in the whole cosmos. This is, mm. this is the great claim of Christian life, of course, as expressed in passages like Romans chapter 8. Mm. Let, let's hone in a little bit more on this, the spiritual senses business. Um, and let, let's maybe focus on... Um, it, obviously, spiritual senses are, is, a, is a reference to the five senses, but let's mm -hmm. think about the intellect for a moment, the mind. Do, do you see the, the spiritual sense as, um, as including our intellectual faculties or, or, or going well beyond it? How, how do you work out the relationship there? Well, one thing that people need to know if this is new to them is that there is no kind of one official doctrine of the spiritual sensation in the Christian tradition. There are a number, a large number of writers within the Christian tradition right across um, the um, patristic, scholastic, early modern period who write about this and each of them is subtly different. So there are some people like Origen himself who appear at times to be using the language of the sensorium as a kind of metaphor for um, the language of the mind um, responding directly to God with a special emphasis, therefore, on the seeing faculty, on perception, mm. because within ancient philosophy, seeing was regarded as the, as it were, the superior sense over the other senses. But there are also times in origin, by the way, when he talks about all five of the senses as, as it were, transformed more directly into a response to Christ, the word, and therefore as um, integrated or united with the intellect and the will. Um, and in the case of Gregory of Nyssa, who develops this doctrine in the late fourth century, there's an especially interesting way in which he sees not just all five of our senses being refined in our lifetime towards response to God in this subtle way, but ultimately being united and integrated with uh, the faculties of the mind and will, um, and at the same time um, bringing us to a state in which we are um, potentially able in our own lifetime, perhaps in our own dying, to start manifesting the features of the resurrection body. There's a wonderful dialogue um, between Gregory and his sister, Macrina, who was an ascetic, and then he writes her life after she's died, in which he describes sitting with her while she was dying, and he sees already anticipatorily in her transformed body what it's going to be like for her to have a resurrection body which um, is very unusual perception in the West, by the way, but it's a theme that gets taken up later in the East um, in quite a number of important um, Eastern Orthodox thinkers, such as Maximus Confessor and Simeon, the new theologian. Fascinating. Well, I, I love this emphasis on the spiritual sense. Let's, let's return just for a moment to the, the empty tomb. Um, Back to brass tacks. <laughs> well, how do you, you know, I've heard a lot of different takes on, on this. Um, yes. Yeah, so you, you named N.T. Wright and I, I would suspect that some of our listeners have read Wright. Um, mm -hmm. His books have been very popular here in the States. Um, you know, he had a lot of dialogues with Marcus Borg and they had, I think a lot of publishing success together. And, and, and you're right. I mean, um, and that that great academic work um, of of his, I forget the title, but it's it's ginormous. I've read a portion of it, but on the resurrection and right got a lot of lot of attention for that. But I know that he 
argues that historically the empty tomb is 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 occurred and the the the, the corpse of Jesus is therefore raised and unavailable and and we can evaluate this in historical terms. Um, my New Testament professor at General Seminary um, appreciates. I cannot speak for Deirdre Good, but I've heard her in a class several years ago um, make the point as other feminist theologians have, that the empty tomb narratives are associated with the women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's a concern that they have not to dismiss the empty tomb in part, you know, because that would dismiss one layer of the resurrection. Um, what would you say to our, to the historians among us, especially our, you know, our enlightenment trained, um, intellectuals in the parish who, who really want to get get down to brass tacks and say what actually happened i want to get down to brass tacks and i've published on this as well and i don't despise this approach mm. whatsoever but as i said earlier i don't think it can solve it it can't clinch it for us yeah um but what i want to say is it is important that the tomb was empty Mm. And there are some liberal theologians in the Anglican world, such as Keith Ward, with whom I had a debate about this um, a few weeks ago at Virginia Seminary, um, who thinks oh, that... Oh, I, I hate that I missed that. I love... <laughs> well, I think it's going to be, it's going to be published. Um, but I, um, for him, um, it's not surprising that there were appearances um, because he thinks Jesus... Yeah effectively in his risen life was a ghost and he himself says he's seen ghosts and he doesn't think this is anything to be very special. Right. Now, I think this is a muddle because um, what I think is clear from the New Testament for all the um, difficulties of bringing the diff different texts into a unity, what is clear from both Paul and all the um, uh, gospel accounts of the resurrection is that Jesus was bodily raised, that the tomb was empty, but the bodiliness of his raisedness was different from his previous bodiliness. But at the same time, it was a personal continuity. Yeah. And this is why Paul then teaches us in 1 Corinthians 15, this mystery, mm -hmm. behold, I tell you a mystery, that what's sown in the flesh is raised in the spirit. So there is there are two kinds of bodies and there's a continuity between them. And what we get in Christ in his resurrection is the first fruits of resurrection, spiritual life, spiritual embodiment, which we can't explain at the moment. Um, science can't explain this for us. Um, ancient scientific theories found it a little bit easier to explain than we do now, I think, because there were theories of spirit life that was also material in some sense. And that seems to be what Jesus's res resurrected body was like. He was able to go through doors, for instance, and, or disappear, come and go, this kind of thing. You can't do that if you've been, if you've got a resuscitated physical body like ours. Mm -hmm. So for me, difficult as it is, I think this is absolutely core to our faith. Mm. That there is a continuity between the body that we now live in and that the body we will eventually enjoy at the end times. Mm. And in Jesus's case, so far, he's the only case that has been bridged already. And he already has his resurrection body, whereas we will get our resurrection body when all things come to conclusion. Um, so it's very important not in one's great desire to justify empirically by evidences that Jesus is raised from the dead, that one doesn't then get into a position where in effect one is arguing that Jesus was resuscitated in the same kind of body. This has to be a different kind of body. Well, I'm so glad you, you referred to 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, maybe one day we can have you back because, you know, that's that great passage for those who are listening to us. It actually begins, some will ask, how are the dead raised? Mm -hmm. So this question of mechanics, and, and that's to, to be unfair, this question of, of, of how can we think about this in, in an intellectually credible way? How can we, we wrestle with this? Um, you know, has, has been there from the very beginning. Absolutely. And, and we don't, you and I don't have time for it today, but it would be really fun to have a, a, a dialogue about where you and I and other scholars, and I'm not a scholar, but where scholars think, especially you, 
Paul lands in that conversation. Because uh, on the one hand, um, well, it's it's interesting. The, there, there's just First Corinthians 15 could not be any any richer. No. And, and Paul really in that one passage uses even contradictory arguments. He does, <laughs> and circular ones as well. But um, <laughs> but what he's what he has to say, of course, is that as that he as one untimely born mm -hmm. also met the risen Christ. But it wasn't in that era which Luke in his gospel and in the Acts sort of cordons off between the resurrection itself and the ascension. Mm -hmm. And so what we've got in the New Testament is a disagreement about whether the ascension tidies Jesus away into heaven mm -hmm. or whether Jesus remains as a, a presence, um, uh, as it were, for all time, as, as it says, I will be with you always at the end of Matthew. Um, and this is this is actually one of the areas where I think we can't do without some demythologization because I'm 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 not subscribing to the view that the ascension, you know, was a, a physical elevation of Jesus somewhere up into the stratosphere. Sure. I just I just don't believe that. Sure. Um, but um, but I do believe it's expressing something very important um, spiritually. But I think it's unfortunate if it's taken to express the as it were absentee. Christ yeah. in our contemporary life. Yeah. I think is Christ is absolutely and fully mm. present with us, uh, between us, within us, when two or three are gathered together in, in, the, in the cosmological world, in the beauty of nature, in the death of all his saints. And for those of us who attend to people who are dying, it's not at all unusual, as you know, Richard, for people to say, I've seen Jesus. Mm -hmm. And usually they look at you and say, as if to say, I know you're not going to believe me. I know you're going to say it's the morphine. Yeah. But I, I do believe them. I do believe them. Yeah. I think Jesus does visit us. Mm -hmm. And it's in a very um, subtle way, um, in a subtle bodied way. Mm -hmm. It may not be visual. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to have more faith in this because it's of such significance to the core of our hope. Well, two things come to mind there. Um, one is, as you know, Gregory of Nyssa loved the word subtle. Mm -hmm. And even in the book, you've, you've um, referenced the dialogues with his sister, mm -hmm. talked about the resurrection body being a subtle body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the second piece, which is unrelated to that, that just comes to mind, especially thinking about Paul, is a part of our limited imagination or limited view on these things because we tend to, well, uh, Paul's whole language of the body of Christ. Paul doesn't yeah. think about bodies in the way most 21st century Americans do as, as a kind of individual body <laughs> that has a, a birth and a life and a death and then is, you know, is onward. I mean, the body is connected to the human body generally speaking, the bodies of communities, is it not? Absolutely. Um, I, can, I can be certain that some people watching this will be thinking, I wonder what she's really talking about in this spiritual sensation business. Uh -huh. And I do think it's tremendously important to say that in practices of prayer in which one renders oneself vulnerable to God and to each other, there grows up over time a most extraordinary sensibility of the mystical body of Christ before and in Christ. Mm. And I don't think it's very easy at all to believe in this approach through spiritual sensation without some kind of growing sensibility about that response. Um, um, it may be useful to use an analogy here of how people are, can be trained, for instance, to look at a piece of artwork such that um, they see the patterning and the beauty in it, which they wouldn't have seen perhaps if they hadn't been shown. And likewise, people who are musicologists listen to music in ways that those of us who are not trained cannot do. And they hear intensely and, are, and see, as it were, at the same time, ordered the way the music is holding together. That's an analogy for this growing sensibility of what it is to respond to Christ in the presence mm -hmm. of the church um, and in the presence of our lives and in the eyes 
of those we meet. Mm. And particularly, says Gregory of Nyssa, the high point of this growth of sensibility will be to be involved in acts of mercy to the poor. Because the place where you will find the prosopon of Christ, the face of Christ, will be actually in the beggar at the gate, as he put it. Mm. So this is a growing sensibility that affects us in the whole, in the round, not only individually, but together. And I hope that gives you a, a, a little bit of a better idea about what I'm trying to grasp at here, because it is obviously very elusive. Mm. It, I'll try to summarize that in, in, a, in a pithy mm. sort of way, but we'll see if this works. Um, when when, when the, the, the whole of, of our lives, the whole of our being mm -hmm. is turned to the risen Christ. Yeah. And, and that includes our, our moral life, our psychological life, um, our days and nights and weeks and months and years. I, is that fair to say? And that's a part of the point. Absolutely. I, I don't know whether anyone knows the, the poetry of R.S. Thomas on the resurrection, but may I just quote about five mm -hmm. lines? Because he has this poem called Suddenly. And he writes, as I had always known he would come unannounced, remarkable merely for the absence of clamor. So truth must appear to the thinker. So at a stage of the experiment, the answer must clearly emerge. I looked at him, not with the eye only, but with the, eye, but with the whole of my being, overflowing with him as a chalice would with the sea. Mm. I think poetry can often express better than one can in philosophical clarificatory ways what the spiritual sensation tradition is attempting to, to grasp. Mm. Well, one last bit on that then before we shift. I, you know, I, um, you know, what I give thanks for um, is that we have these incredible gospel stories with all of these details in them. And, and some of the details make rational sense. Some of them at first don't. I mean, it, but it has, it's a story that we enter into mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I think for, for our listeners, that shouldn't be lost as well. Where, where you land on this intellectually um, perhaps matters less than the fact that you, you, the story becomes something that you live and wrestle with all the days of your lives. And, and, and undoubtedly, there are times in our life where, where one thing resonates more than something else. As I said in my Easter sermon on Sunday, I've been preaching this for 21 years. And um, what, what stood out to me more than anything this year, more than any other year, was that in John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb while it was still dark. Mm, yes, yes. And, and um, uh, you know, that, that just little line mm. that, that has appeared to me in previous years as a kind of throwaway line just this year, um, you know, has incredible power and, and, and relevance. And, and, and that's true for us individually. And that's true in different seasons. These stories have all these wonderful and mysterious details and it's wrestling with the story and our own story. That's a piece of the turning. And, you know, virtually no one in the new Testament story gets it immediately right yeah. and and paul least of all <laughs> he kicks against the pricks he refuses this christ until christ actually meets him and um so i i think we should think of resurrection as a journey that we're engaged in um and a revelation that may dawn gradually but we should always be looking um looking for evidences in our own lives that Christ is alive and transforming all our relationships and bringing hope out of despair. That's really the, the arc of the spiritual senses response. Yeah. Well, speaking of journey, let, let's shift a bit. So, and this is going to be, I'll try to set it up just a little bit because this is a, a bit of a dramatic shift, but I think it's coherent and follows from what you've been saying so obviously resurrection is, is, is not just about, it is absolutely about, about this life and all the examples that you're giving and how, you know, God raises the dead, so to speak, on, on this side of the grave. And we could give all kinds of compelling examples, um, and we've already alluded to a few. 
where, where life overcomes death or, or, or some new path emerges uh, in the midst of, of trauma or in the midst of the mundane that we never could have anticipated. And, and I think that's one of the many resonances with the resurrection, but certainly resurrection of the dead um, also relates to the, the Christian view of heaven and, and life after death. Mm-hmm. And you, you've uh, much of your published work is um, concerned with the scholar you mentioned or the, the bishop you mentioned, Gregory of Nyssa. And Gregory of Nyssa is really fascinating. And he has this great book. I think if, if, if anyone was picking up just any book of Gregory of Nyssa's to begin with, it, it, perhaps start with Life of Moses. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just such a classic. And what, what he does is he takes the, the journey of Moses up to Mount Sinai um, into the darkness where, where Moses meets God as a metaphor image for um, progression in, in, in God's presence. And one of the things that's true for, for Gregory of Nyssa that I, I know you're fascinated by, and I certainly am, but his idea that, that heaven is not this place of, it's not a static place, um, but it's actually a, a, a place of progression might be the wrong word. Journey is, is probably a good one, but a place of development and growth. And why? Because God is this infinite, you know, being of mystery and beauty and truth and love. Would you say a little bit about um, whether it's it's Gregory's views or yours, but but of heaven being this place of dynamism. Well, that's very particular to Gregory in the East in the fourth century because his whole um, theological anthropology is based in working out a notion of human desire. For him, desire is the core constellating notion of the of the human, and he says it's in the nature of our desire for God that it is never satisfied because God is God is infinite and beyond our comprehension and therefore the, the, the higher up the mountain we go the more peaks we glimpse ahead of us and therefore unending desire will be our lot according to him even after death um, and that's not something to be worried about it's precisely the opposite it's, it's a, a, a journey of endless endless interest and delight This is different, of course, from the later Western view that grew up about purgatory and um, what might happen after death in terms of um, your being distributed um, later, either to the the blessed or to to hell. And different again, actually, from later Byzantine thinking that often thought about life after death because of the problem of how the body at this point is, for now, separated from the, the soul, seemingly, that um, we are, as it were, kept alive within the memory of the divine um, in this interim period between our own individual deaths and the final coming of Christ. We don't, we don't know the answer to this, um, but um, I think that uh, our, our, the, the, livelier, the livelier are our faith, the livelier are our belief in Christ's resurrection, the more wonderful this journey seems. And... Um, how exciting it seems to be able to die. And as Paul <laughs> says, to die is to gain. Mm-hmm. To die is to go into this next phase of the journey, whatever it may involve. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, I, I think that's just <laughs> fascinating. And, um, you know, it, it was eye-opening for me to begin to imagine heaven in, in, in that sort of way. It gets a lot more interesting. And interestingly enough, um, you know, life on earth becomes that much more interesting mm-hmm. because we're talking about subtlety and growth and change and, and, and turning again and again. And, and I want to use that as a way of, of shifting to our, our last question. Um, all, all Christians know that, you know, when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, that, that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so one of the fascinating things is the way we imagine heaven and the way we imagine God absolutely influences the way we imagine humanity and a good life on earth or good politics or good whatever. And I know that you are um, working and, and already lecturing and thinking about the relationship between the spiritual life mm-hmm. and some of these themes and what we've been especially re- wrestling with in the United States with the, the, the horror of, of white supremacy mm-hmm. And whether it's George Floyd on one hand, all the way through uh, 
the, the tragic reality of, of, of policing in this country all the way through the fact that the vast majority of the people who are in our jails are African-American males and the unveiling of that for a lot of white people such as, as me, you, you, you're starting to do a lot of thoughts on that, that in relation to the spiritual life, do you mind saying just a bit about that? And I realize I'm opening up, you know, going in a whole new direction, but would you be willing to say just a bit about that and where your thought and writing is headed? It's a complicated argument. I'm writing a second volume of my systematics entitled Sin, Racism, and Divine Darkness. Um, and the place I start is with the presumption, which I think is the birthright of our baptisms, that the greatest tragedy of ra all racisms um, is that it robs us of our unitedness with each other in Christ um, and with God. And the question is, how on earth have we devised these systems which keep us segregated, uh, keep us working with sometimes the unconscious presumption of the inferiority of one form of person over against another? And I think we're living through a period now when all the optimism of the 1960s, which I can remember as a very young adolescent, that the civil rights movement would bring amelioration through democratic processes, education, economic reforms, and so on and so forth, is resulting in tremendous Afro-pessimism about that whole mm -hmm. Enlightenment project. And I, in the midst of struggling with this, I heard a black rapper from St. Louis after the Michael Brown death saying that the civil rights movement had failed because he said, his name is Tef Poe, and he said, and that's because what, what our problem really is, is a problem of seeing. Mm -hmm. Now, I found this tremendously interesting because it went right to the heart of what I've been talking with you this morning about. That is, under what conditions do we see reality? Mm -hmm. Under what conditions do we see each other as beloved of God? Under what conditions do we see each other as belonging together? in Christ, inextricably and forever. Mm -hmm. And this took me into a whole set of reflections about how we have to rethink again the relationship between racism and sin. In the popular, of course, political divisions that we're now facing, left and right, sin doesn't usually feature as a topic. <laughs> I don't think we can do without the notion of sin in the history of American racism. It was Christianity that concocted American racism. It was Christianity that therefore besmirched its own Christianity by creating this human system. Um, and Christianity thus must face how on earth this whole systemic um, arrangement of society is uh, founded on a sinful response. And what I do here, just very briefly, is to look at that moment in the fall story, which I call the second moment. The first moment is the very elusive moment when the apple is eaten. And something very fundamental goes wrong here, which the Christianity tradition doesn't, by the way, agree on unanimously. But clearly, what was being quested for here was the discernment of good and evil, which is a good thing in itself. But it was taken in a way that separated us from God rather than uniting us with God. It was some kind of misaggregation of our desires with God's desire for us. So at the heart of our sin is something wrong with our desires. The second moment is the one that I think is so vital for the seedbed of racism, particularly the kinds of racism that we can't see. <laughs> that is, that's the moment at which there is a simultaneous sense of total shame, of immediate other blame, of self-deception, and of something going wrong with the way that we see ourselves as naked. Yeah. These all go together in this extraordinarily important second moment. Mm. Um, and I see that as the seedbed of all forms of racism, and incidentally, all forms of sexism as well, because the story here of how um, 
uh, Adam blames the woman. Sure. And this in turn turns into a false version of desire. It's given a new word, Tashuka, which is a kind of servile sexual attraction mm -hmm. to her husband. These are these happen together. So there's something very deeply entangled uh, in the relationship of basic forms of sin and sexism and racism. It's not a coincidence that the early slave traders also set up um, bordellos, right, or supplied women for sex. So we need to go back there. What is the solution? I think the solution is no magic wand because the solution is this uh, ability to confront what I call the interior landscape of racism. We can do all kinds of things and we need to do all kinds of exterior things in our politics, economics, education, social relations, et cetera, et cetera, to overcome seg seg segregation and, um, uh, and prejudice. But we can't overcome prejudice by waving a wand. This is a very, very painful interior process. Mm -hmm. And it's just as painful for the oppressed one as for the oppressor. Mm -hmm. The oppressed one is holding all the pain and anguish and anger and resentment as a result of centuries of ill treatment. So there are practices involved and a call and a need for communities committed to these painful processes of interior transformation through, as I would say, in part, spiritual sensation. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, Afro-American author on whom I draw most profoundly here, you will not be surprised to know, although I think his work is in danger of being kind of defanged by his po new popularity in Episcopalians is, is Howard Thurman, because sure. his, his meditations about his own interior struggles with the effects of racism give us an absolutely fantastic model for what it is to sit alongside each other, straining in the spirit um, for healing and reconciliation. Uh, Dr. Cookley, thank you so much. And you're, you're, you're generous um, with your time and your, your mind that, that, that you allowed us to tuck that in here at the end. And, and, um, so more to come, and, and I can't wait to see your, your new volume, and, and we will certainly extend an invitation once that book is out for a conversation here in Denver. And it's a delight and an honor to have been with you, and um, I wish you the great happiness of continuing to enjoy the presence of Christ in, in this resurrection period. And let me say how much I admire the work that you are doing in theological education which I think in our generation has become all the more significant. Um, mm. I would say that as an academic, but um, I think you are a, a leading exponent of the need for people to be involved in lifelong um, struggle and, uh, a, a, and investigation of mm. divine realities. Mm. Well, much thanks for those kind words and, and um, you know, you, you're, you're an eloquent testimony to why our lives and our society depend upon this and, and how we think about God um, influences the way we live. Um, well, I'm really grateful. Um, God bless you and yours and happy Easter. And for all who are joining us, we're really grateful that you've been here and, and, and thought through this together with us. Um, Please join us if you um, have the time and feel so called. Our, our service of Holy Eucharist begins at the same place, sjcathedral.org, at 1030 a.m. You are well, warmly welcomed. And again, Dr. Coakley, much thanks. Thank you.